And Ethernet, as we've seen, was really a, uh, uh, please come on up, Gordon, um, was a uh, answer to the problem of distributed uh, computing and how do we connect those, uh, how do we connect those computers and connect them to printers, in fact, as we, uh, as we heard this, uh, uh, this morning. But we've also heard how much what Ethernet is and the architecture has evolved. And so we want to spend a little, little bit of time talking about um, architecture, the role that it plays, and um, how that has affected the evolution of the, of the uh, Ethernet. So, and I would uh, uh, like to welcome uh, our panel here. We have with us today, um, and again, I'm going to uh, use the haiku introduction. Um, Gordon Bell, and I think if I just say PDP and VAX um, is, a, is a sufficient. Um, the um, uh, Glenn Reichart uh, really played a role in institutionalizing uh, institution-wide lands. And uh, uh, Radia Pierman, we heard from this morning, uh, spanning trees. Uh, not 10 base tree, but spanning trees. Um, so maybe to um, get the conversation started uh, from, from here, um, how much of the original Ethernet do we actually see today? Well, um, I mean, actually, mostly just the, uh, the packet format. But um, there's extreme confusion about, um, you know, like Ethernet and IP, aren't they basically doing the same thing, that you put your data in an envelope and it, um, and why do we have both of them and stuff? Now, um, <laughs> uh, to say it sort of uh, controversially, uh, people kind of think that standards bodies are kind of well-educated technologists carefully weighing engineering trade-offs. But a much more accurate way to think of it is as drunken sports fans. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm always trying to figure out what's the inherent difference between technology A and technology B. And um, you know, people, nobody knows them both. So I have these two 600-page um, specs that are incomprehensible. Um, if I ask an advocate for A, how does it compare with B? They say, well, A is awesome and B sucks. And um, then we you heard that this morning. <laughs> right. And then you find out about um, some things about B that are better, and you point that out to the A people, and no problem, they steal the ideas, still saying that A is awesome and B sucks. So um, at any rate, people kind of assume that the architecture of the internet um, is like some brilliant thing, and that's why it succeeded. But in fact, it's an incredible set of kludges. Um, um, the worst decision, the single worst decision in the history of mankind wow. <laughs> <laughs> was that in 1992, people said, hey, the IP address is too small, it's four bytes. Why don't we replace it with ISO's version that had a 20-byte address? And actually, if we'd done that, we would have had bigger addresses now. And um, Ethernet sort of wouldn't have been a separate thing. So um, it, um, it, it would have been kind of the, the physical link that would interconnect a network. Um, but you know, it was all sort of not invented here kinds of things. It also had something that was technically superior to um, the, the notion of IP getting you to an Ethernet cloud and then doing Ethernet inside of the cloud. Um, the ISO layer three thing had a prefix, a 14 byte prefix that got you to a cloud and then you had this flat address space inside um, once you got there, that was the six byte address and um, the end nodes let the routers know where they were so you had perfectly perfect routing there. Um, today you can kind of simulate that with IP getting you to a flat cloud. Uh, oh, the flat cloud is very nice so that you can do virtualization and stuff within a data center and move around without changing your address. So you can do that with Ethernet, but when you when you had both of them in the same address, it was very nice. With um, Today with IP, you get to the cloud and then you have to do this ARP kludge uh, to shout and say who has that, this address in order uh, to convert it. So, um, you know, w whether it was the architecture that made things um, succeed, no. I mean, we can get around any sort of 
kludge, and we do. The fact that we've lived with IPv4 this many years is, is astonishing because, you know, we keep coming up with NATs and DHCP and things uh, to enable you to do that. But back to Ethernet, yeah, it really is, as I said, CSMACD doesn't exist very much except in the wireless stuff. And other than that, it's really just like a layer three protocol. Well, let me, let me talk about some of the architectural principles <laughs> yes. that, that seem to be surviving that, that comes out. I think Andy Grove said, uh, only the paranoid survive, a little book on that. You know, I think that in architecture, only the simple and flexible survive. And simple and flexible, having a, a vision for what it might be. I was most taken this morning, uh, Bob, with your diagram that showed you could have an air ether, you could have a wire ether. I'm not sure if you got a, a water ether in there too, but you could have lots of different ethers that could go and work with this technology. And the idea of being able to visualize that this could go into other domains have that be evolvable has really been, I think, one of the big secrets of, of Ethernet, that you can go and evolve it from one medium to another, from one speed to another. And I think most critically, if you're going to have a new technology, make sure that you keep the name of the successful last technology. <laughs> so the new technology gets called Ethernet too, and therefore it becomes uh, successful by So branding is a key architectural branding principle. Branding is a key architectural principle. Would you agree with that, Gordon? Yeah, it's like Fortran. Uh, <laughs> you know, what, whatever we have to communicate, it's going to be Ethernet. Uh, and I, I think that'll exist. You know, uh, Bill Howe just uh, st uh, reminded me that in, when we announced it in the, uh, at the World <coughs> Trade Center in, I think, 81 or 82, I had predicted this thing will last well into the 2000s. And, and uh, he said, wow, I didn't know that was going to happen. And, but uh, so I think, again, this, you know, we'd like to say certainly Ethernet will last well into the, in the 2050s or, or so. So I can, I think, be safe in that. So, uh, I, uh, still, I still have Ethernet. I mean, uh, I was an electrician as a child, and so I can't imagine life without wire. Uh, every time I move into a new uh, apartment or building or something, the first thing I do is uh, tear up all the ceilings and everything and, and lay down wire. I just, I just don't trust wireless. So, so, I, uh, built, <laughs> so I, I built a custom house, and uh, as, while it was still open, okay. I went and I started installing, um, you know, Cat5 cable, Cat5 oh, cable. Cat, cat six, yeah. and, and the joke in the neighborhood is, what is the R value of the Cat5 e cables <laughs> in Glenn's house? <laughs> I did also, for those of you who are wireless folks, I did put in some little cubby holes in strategic places so that you can have the invisible oh, access point so that you can do that as well. But there's still nothing like plugging in and getting That's a rock-solid right. connection. So, so is, are there, you know, in addition to branding, and keep it simple, stupid. Are there other architectural principles that allowed for this evolution? I mean, that's kind of what we heard is, you know, well, call the latest thing and then, you know, keep it simple and, and be practical. Are there other architectural principles that we can learn here? Well, I really, I really think there are. One of the interesting things was choice of an appropriate packet size, right? Not 43 bytes and mm. not something that would be infinite, but something that would right. be a reasonable packet size. I think that having the packet size, uh, I guess maximum, I don't know, 15 or 100 or 30 or something, has, has actually been one of the things that is a constant, even with a lot of the other changes that have Perfect. occurred in this thing we call Ethernet. Why is that important? That's important because it means that people running on top of that don't have to change their programming and start using something different because something underneath changed. And that allows for a smooth evolvability, right, Radia? Actually, I, I like having much bigger uh, packet formats. Once you're not really sharing the wire, you don't really need to have a um, limit to the size of the packet. Mm -hmm. But um, th what you said before about flexibility. So like English um, is a living language. Um, it, it's a, a full of kludges, you know, like the spelling and, you know, new words every, every year and whatever. But um, it can evolve kind of gracefully. And that's kind of an important um, aspect that you can change uh, the physical links um, and, you know, a lot of things uh, we can accommodate. Right. Yeah. Another thing that struck me was really the design to the most demanding application. A lot of times today we'll design to the average application, 
but designing to the most demanding. In the case that uh, Bob had, it was that printing device that required so many pixels to be laid down on the paper, caused it to be designed to a level in which it could accommodate a lot of other applications. I think that was another important thing. You agree? Ah, well, it, 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 Ray and I can disagree. It's okay. <laughs> right. Um, if you de um, design for the most, um, um, you know, strict application, I mean, there would be quality of service and reserved things and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's that's what the token ring guy said. We are reliable, that's right? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so that didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> right, so we don't really need to do that. If you're talking about having adequate speed, um, yes, I mean, and we, the more speed we get, we can manage to eat up with uh, stupid pop-up ads and things like that. It used to be <laughs> 56 KB was all you needed to, to but yeah, right. Well, so we, uh, during that era, we had pushed uh, from, three, there was, it was running with the, the, at Park uh, at three uh, three or three point three me megabits, and then uh, we sort of we got it, and we said, "What's the fastest we can possibly go on on these big yellow cables?" And it was okay. Ten was a ten was a nice number, and and that that and, and in fact, I recall in nineteen ninety, I was uh, uh, when I was away f had been away from digital that. What's with these people? We haven't moved from 10 megabits for a decade, and all kinds of things were setting in. Uh, there was a uh, uh, fiber channel. I don't know. It's fiber channel. There, were, there, were, there was an optical ring channel, uh, and all of these things were coming in to replace Ethernet if they hadn't finally gotten up to raise the standard and to basically go to a hub. Sure. Uh, hub architecture. That was a the, that was kind the, of a a, a a null period. Could could I maybe uh, switch topics slightly in the sense to build on it in the sense of so what we've heard is you know yeah. this has evolved radically from where it started and what the problem was intended to 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 solve um, from connecting a couple of hundred PCs to billions um, literally across the world today. And we also heard a great quote this morning, I think, um, uh, that somebody used was about sometimes with new innovations, what we do is we pave the cow paths, right? Meaning we, we first try to do what we've done better. And so we've ended up with this complex architecture. And if we started over, if we could rip it out and start over, would we end up with the system we have today? And, and if not, can we get to where we need to be for the future from where we are, to, from where we are today? No, I, I look back and I think it's, it was kind of a very, very natural uh, kind of uh, evolution. Uh, everybody has a different model of what we wanted out of, out of Ethernet. And in fact, when digital signed on with, uh, uh, with Xerox, what w we were looking for basically a, re uh, a, a simple network uh, switching structure to connect not PCs because they we didn't have them yet but uh, we wanted to connect our small mini computers so that we could compete with IBM in a larger larger framework because we saw the world with a number of minis in a, in a distributed network and all we wanted was basically a uh, a way to have to be able to put concentrators for terminals and to be able to have those concentrators connected to minis. That was our goal. And so 10 megabits was very important to us from that. And, and in fact, when I sold it within di digital, it was like, well, this other thing is going to evolve. Uh, and it did evolve to, a, to a ser the server uh, concept. And then, and then when I actually, uh, one of the companies I was involved with later on uh, we found out, hey, this doesn't really work. You need to have, you know, you don't have a shared disk and we're trying to use the shared disk back to a uh, workstation. That was a bad idea. So you basically have disks on every workstation. So uh, that whole, uh, whole evolution was a, little, was a little bit different. So it was kind of natural. I just see it as a natural progression. Go in as simply as you can, put the minimal, and, and this keeps coming up in, in startups all the time. What is the minimal acceptable 
uh, uh, concept, and then research what is the minimal acceptable paper that you can write. Because you, you, know, you need to write a lot of papers out there. You've got to get your name out there. And so what's the smallest publishable idea? So we t in research, we talk about this minimal publishable, publishable idea. Uh, so again, it, and that's that's why we have so much trouble with uh, with uh, we, all the complaints we heard about. Oh my God, isn't it awful? With we don't, we're not funding research. I say oh, we're probably funding it is a lot, hell of a lot more than ever. They're just we had funded it so well. We just got so many people out there that have to go to this big feeding trough to get federal fu federal funding. So. Uh, so I'm, I'm just d dishing the last panel a little bit on that. It ain't, ain't it awful? I don't see it as awful at all. I don't, don't see it as anything different than, than we've ever had. I see, see a very exciting thing. I see a no, still a uh, constant set of great ideas and a constant set of really dumb ideas. And how could you be possibly starting a company on that? Uh, uh, that to knock off Facebook or whatever. But... Uh, uh, I don't, I don't, I mean, I just see nothing but exciting things going ahead in terms of whether it's wireless or, or whatever, and we'll call a lot of them Ethernet and, and, uh, and the Internet or the web or whatever. And so, it's great if we can have compatibility in these things, especially oh, in yeah. networks. You don't make it until you've got right. that transitional way. It's, so, the tra it's the transition. So I just have to tell you a quick story. Is I wanted to do a little bit of experiment to see how slower speeds and faster speeds affect networking. And if you come hear my keynote tomorrow, I'm going to tell you the results of that experiment. Okay. But I needed to go and slow things down. So I said, how can I slow down my network? So I went to my closet, and sure enough, I found an old Ethernet hub. And it had an AUI connector for the old, uh, you know, vampire tap, and had a BNC right. connector on it. it. Had thank goodness it had a couple of 10 base T adapters because that was what I actually had cables for these days. Plugged it in, slowed things down to 10 megabits. I hadn't had that thing out in 20 years. Plug it in, plug it to my new devices, my gigabit port, and sure enough, it all slows down to 10 megabits and does the right thing. So it was great. I was able to do this experiment in almost zero time thanks to the compatibility <laughs> from gigabit ports all the way down to the original 10 megabits for 10 base T. So then, to, to my question, you don't feel we are paying any price, really, for this evolutionary path, that it's going to, we're going to be able to evolve to where we need to get to? And if so, maybe where do you think some of those places were evolving to, and what are some of the challenges? Well, of course, you pay a price, but I wanted to point out the opposite, which is that you pay a price for any disruption in what happens. I think if the world started over again today, which it hasn't, but if the world started over again today, you'd probably make most things fiber-based. We would have lots of plastic fiber connectors, glass fiber connectors, and that would be the way in which we would go and wire these things together. Packet format still wants to remain simple. In fact, on some of the uh, newest um, networks where you've got some uh, software-defined networking and programmability, you can take some of the things that layer three is doing, move that into the control plane, and what that leaves on the data plane are things that look remarkably like, just like Ethernet packets. So it may be that the future is the past, in that the um, single thing that we can all agree on is the Ethernet packet. How we control it might move from a header to a uh, control plane, but still, the Ethernet packet survives. Radia, any views? <laughs> OK. Um, do you mean Ethernet or do you mean IP? But um, yeah, the, um, the underlying stuff, I mean, it, you can look at uh, you know, all kinds of kludges and stuff, but that, it doesn't matter. We can work around all that. So it's kind of uglier than it needs to be. Um, but the internet actually doesn't really work the way that um, you know engineers envisioned it, which was that you have a DNS name and you type that in and it turns it into an IP address and then it gets rooted based on that. Um, it's actually you know with with NATs and um, people don't search for DNS names; they they search for shoes and. Uh, that, that's one of the miracles of the internet, that you want a weird kind of shoe, you search for it on the internet, you get a bunch of uh, vendors that you've never heard of in countries you've never heard of, and um, uh, you decide which one is cheapest, and you give them your credit card, and shoes appear. 
I mean, <laughs> and, and credit card goes over. <laughs> right, right, and and it's safe, and uh, you know, like uh, um, th these vendors that you never heard of um, before. Yeah, by the way, another miracle to me is Wikipedia. There's sort of no excuse for that not just being filled with graffiti. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the idea that anybody can edit it, and yet it seems to be like the um, the main place that you go to for nice, well-written, concise uh, descriptions of various technologies. So it's not exactly clear what the internet is. It really isn't the IP packet format or the Ethernet packet format. Yeah. So, so John, I want to ask you your own question. What do you think? Um, the uh, uh, well, two, uh, two comments. I'm not a network expert, but um, um, actually at, at PARC we are working on some new network technologies um, that for compatibility reasons have got to run on top of <laughs> um, TCP IP, but um, one of the things we're trying to address is uh, security. I mean, right now, this, you know, do we really want, you know, everything is open and unsecured and, and you know, bits flying across and then we have to uh, you know, at an application layer, worry about that. So, how could we make security a network, uh, a, a network provided capability, uh, instead of uh, an overlay that we have to manage at the application layer? That's, I think, a place we need to evolve. Right. But, Radio, you've been worrying about that all your life. <laughs> right, right. So. Um, it's not clear what the word security means. So you can't just sort of take a technology and then say, make it secure, because secure means a whole bunch of things. Does it mean the ability to be untraceable and be a, um, a whistleblower, the ability to not get deluged with um, uh, you know, phone calls or... or um, um, so first, I mean, I actually think that you should have a very, very simple pipe that you can send information, and any sort of uh, privacy or anything like that should be done um, um, end to end. Um, but there is the issue of the just, um, you know, starving things out with, uh, you know, what with DDoS and, and things like that where uh, people have all these client machines that are so easily, right. um, um, you know, uh, compromised. Over, right. right. Um, I, I, why we can't design simpler clients that can't, you know, like we used to tell people, don't boot from infected floppy. Now we have to tell them, well, you know, we've sold you this fine computer and everything's wonderful, but don't actually turn it on. Uh, right. You know, or play, right. The downside don't read of an the, email. Right. Don't don't open a PowerPoint presentation because any of the right. The um, downside of the network. Maybe we should see if there's some questions yeah. uh, from the audience. I have a sure. question. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, we have a mic over here. Raise your hand again so they know. Yeah, Bob Emerson again. I'm sorry I'm always hogging the questions. Uh, Glenn uh, semi-anticipated my question, which was to ask uh, what is going on with software-defined uh, networking in the Internet. I mean, I'm not an expert at all, but it would, my naive opinion would be there's an enormous potential there. I think there is enormous potential there. I think that um, there's two things going on, uh, well, three things maybe. The separation of the control plane and data plane, I already talked about, is actually a big deal and simplifies a number of things about how we handle uh, packets. Second one is that uh, in certain situations, it allows for virtualization. And it's a, a shortcut to virtualization. And I think network function virtualization may change business models, business models for how networks get used. And I think that that is likely to uh, provoke some significant changes in the internet going forward. And then the third thing is that up until very recently, the, the network was dumb and the endpoints were smart. And again, Rady has been working on this for a long time, and Gordon has too actually, but when you can program the network on a dynamic basis, on a per-application basis, I think some very interesting things are happening. You agree, Gordon? Yeah, but I'm, I'm, I have to reduce it to, okay, how do we do, what, how do we do it and what's the implica implication there? Uh, uh, 
you know, the movement of control and state, uh, there's, hey, these are, these are all state machines, and I, I like to have the, the state that's the changing things as explicit as possible, and that sort of pushes it more out to the, to the edge and instead of getting it into the sort of big ball in the middle. So I, I worry a little bit about that when you sort of say, do you really want a smart network there or not? Or just give me uh, links between that uh, from, fr uh, fr at the edges and the dealing with quality. That says you've got to deal with the quality of service somehow, whether you use uh, SN7. I don't know, you're arguing for an SN7, I, I heard there. Uh, well, maybe not a SS7, but maybe something that is uh, for a network like what an operating system did for time sharing to allow multiple applications to, to optimally use that set of facilities available. Maybe there is a way of taking a look at a more global view of a network and more optimally using the set of facilities available. So time for uh, one more question if we have out in the audience. I have a question for Bob. Yeah. Is Bob sitting over there someplace? Yes, Bob. So Manchester encoding was a key thing, right? Manchester encoding was also used on deck tapes, and it was used to go and, again, do the kind of clocking on the deck tapes when the tape was coming up to speed and slowing down. It allowed the uh, clock to be maintained even though the tape speed was changing. I was wondering if this had anything to do with your inspiration for uh, using the Manchester encoding on uh, Ethernet. I was a heavy user of deck tapes, but I did not ever know that they had Manchester encoding on them. <laughs> okay, that answers well, that one. And, and, and I'll plug deck, uh, deck tape. It was also a, uh, it had full redundancy. There were two analog uh, signals that were added together. So it was analog adding of redundancy there, and you could actually punch one uh, side of it. And, you, and by the way, we can still read deck tapes and <laughs> link tape, which was the ancestor of deck tape. So I wanted to comment on the title of this session. So to me, the two key architectural features of the internet, including ethernet, is the uh, packet switching is an architecture. And, sure. and in the beginning, yes. departing from circuit switching was a huge architectural step. And then the layering, the ISO layering of the level one, level two, up through level seven. That was a really important architectural uh, decision about how to build the internet. Are we about to change? Should we consider changing those two architectural decisions? Um, I would say it really doesn't matter. I mean, either one of them could have worked just fine. Um, and um, in terms of this whole software-defined networking, um, it, it, you know, everywhere I go, you know, I see these uh, things about what a privilege to be born at this point in history when software-defined networking will transform the planet. Um, <laughs> Um, it's actually a buzzword that means a whole bunch of different things to different people. Uh, the concept of separation of control and data plane, that, that's been done for a while. Um, um, whether you have uh, the, um, the forwarding tables that tell the switches what to do, um, done with a distributed algorithm or one central place, that's also ATM, InfiniBand, you know, did it with a central thing. You could do either one, so it's not, you know, I don't think any of this stuff is transformational. We can get by, um, the fact that we can get by on the internet with four byte addresses, even today, is, is just really astonishing. So I don't think anything will make the difference between the internet working or not. Well, on that note, I think that's the definition of a very robust architecture. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> robust to any change. Why don't we uh, thank our panel?